Uh, welcome to PNP Live. My name is Margaret Orto and I'm the events coordinator at Politics and Prose in the Children and Teens Department. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for a conversation with Andrea Davis Pinckney and Brian Pinckney in conversation with Jason Reynolds to celebrate publication of Loretta Little Looks Back, Three Voices Go Tell It, a monologue novel. And I want to just show you the cover. Um, a few housekeeping items before introductions. We'll be dropping the book purchase link for Loretta Little into the chat during this conversation. Uh, you can order the book tonight during the event or always from our store, either online or in person. We do have signed book plates with book purchase while supplies last. Um, this evening, you can ask a question by clicking Q&A located at the bottom of your screen, and you can also upvote on a question that you'd like to see answered. At the end of the conversation, we'll get to a few audience questions. As always, please remember this is a creative, safe space, and we ask that attendees be respectful of one another in any questions and comments. Now, on to introductions. Andrea Davis Pinckney's numerous best-selling and award-winning books for young readers include The Red Pencil, Bird in a Box, and A Poem for Peter. In addition to writing, she is the vice president and editor-at-large for Scholastic Trade Books. Brian Pinckney has illustrated many books for children, including two Caldecott honor books, and he has written and illustrated several of his own books. He is the recipient of the Coretta Scott King Book Award for illustration and four Coretta Scott King honors. Together, as an author, artist team, Andrea and Brian Pinckney have created beloved works such as Martin Rising, Requiem for a King, Hand in Hand, Ten Black Men Who Changed America, and Boycott Blues, How Rosa Parks Inspired a Nation. Of their newest collaboration, Loretta Little, School Library Journal said, the combination of elements drawing on oral tradition and folklore set this book apart, making it an unforgettable reading experience. The Pinkneys join us from Brooklyn, New York, where they live. We're delighted that they're in conversation tonight with author Jason Reynolds. Jason, uh, Jason has numerous best-selling and award-winning middle, middle grade and young adult novels. Uh, most recently, he collaborated with Ibram X. Kendi on the nonfiction Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. He is the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature and lives here in Washington, D.C. Welcome everyone, and now I'm going to turn the conversation over to you. Take it away. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, so look, this is how this is going to go. I, 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 anybody who knows me knows I like to keep it pretty informal, uh, just because there's no need to be formal around family. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with the two of you, with the pink knees. Uh, two of the pink knees. There's a lot of pink knees, but two, two of the two of the pink knees. Uh, and, I, and before we get started, I want to say um, a few really quick things. Number one, uh, y'all, you know, I have a lot of respect for the work that you all have done in this industry, and uh, and you know your your work and your your repertoire and your oeuvre and and all of the things that you've contributed shouldn't be taken lightly. So first and foremost, thank you for years and years and years of so much work, so many bricks in the wall of children's literature, especially about black babies. Uh, number two, if you have a question, please put your question in the Q&A box. Uh, please buy the book. I know everyone is here to listen to them talk uh, and let's have a bit of a conversation. The truth of the matter is there is a bottom line uh, and you please, you need to purchase the book to support them, but also to support the bookstore because we are in dire times. And so it requires a little more effort. Please purchase the book from Politics and Prose. You can do it right now. I'm sure there's a link somewhere in the chat, you know what I mean? Make it happen. All right, this book, I have to tell y'all, this book might be, this might be my favorite book uh, of the year. Um, it's interesting because I read a lot of books, obviously, and um, this, I, I have to say, I was, um, this was a lot for me because my family comes from South Carolina. My mother and family were, they picked cotton and sharecropping farms. Uh, my mother was one of the women, one of the, the children who picked cotton. My grandfather was abandoned uh, by his mother, uh, who fled north to uh, go and have a better life um, or try to build a better life for herself. 
Um, I have my grandma's voter card in, in, in my living room framed on the wall, right? the very first voter registration card she fought for. I have her, uh, her job application as she tried to stop being a charwoman or stop being a, a, a domestic worker and tried to be a charwoman for the government but couldn't pass the written test because they made it overly complicated even though she would still be cleaning buildings. Um, and so reading this was just a, um, it felt like, it felt like stitches in my own tapestry in a way that was almost a little strange. Um, the second thing I want to say about it is that it also reminded me of this. And I don't know how many of you out there know this book, uh, but this is Came by Gene Toomer, the only book I think we have of Gene Toomer's. And it was written a long, long time ago, I believe in the 1920s. Uh, and it's, and it's, it has multi sort of dimensions in terms of the forms and formats that he's writing in all the way back then. It's sort of a, a mosaic uh, of literature to build this story. And that's what you all are doing here. So my first question before I get into the, the logistics of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the craft and some story stuff, why? Why, why this book? Like, where, where, where does this come from? Well, Jason, first of all, good evening. Hello, everybody. And I'm just so delighted and honored and happy to be here with Jason and my beautiful, amazing husband. And you know what, Jason, you said it, Black babies, that's why. And like you, I heard these stories when I was on a porch, when I was a kid, on summer nights with fireflies and sweet tea. And I heard them over and over and over. And that was what stitched the tapestry of my own life. And I, I you know, I, th that's what stays with us, you know? And I said, these are the stories I wanna tell. I've heard them and I've heard so many of us have these similar stories with family and, and, and those are the stories that endure, especially now. Those are the stories that our kids need to know, you know, where they came from and why they are out on the streets and sidewalks of Brooklyn, New York, where I live, holding Black Lives Matter signs. Mm -hmm. What led them to this point? And, and that's, why, that's why I wrote Loretta Little Looks Back. You know, so much of what's going on now is because of what went on before. You know, one of my favorite scenes in the book is, you know, young Aggie B, she goes with her aunt. Nobody wants to register to vote. And there this 12-year-old girl gets that hand up and she wants to go register, even though she's not old enough. Absolutely. And that's, that's fine. It, it does feel like a, like a contextualization of today's time, right? This is what contextualizes it for the young people today. Like, we don't live in a vacuum. Our protest movements don't exist in vacuums, right? We're talking about a long line of, of people who have been pushing back against oppression. Um, Brian, I want to get to you in just a second, because I'm curious about, about, about even what it was like for you to have to, to, have to, 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 have to draw. I mean, first of all, I wish I, I should have, I should have, uh, pulled out of some of some of the some of the your drawings in here but we're talking about like just beautiful beautiful etchings of black people at, at, at different at different points in our history and I, and I do have I want to make sure I, I want to ask you a couple questions too but first before I do Brian I want to ask Andrea why all the different styles right and, which for me by the way is like my jam so for me I'm, I'm reading it and I'm like oh this is what I'm talking about because because I I think that sometimes we forget that we can do everything in a book, right? That we can that we can stretch and we can kind of make whatever we want to make. It's art, right? So we can say, all right, we're gonna do some poems, we're gonna do some, you know, some monologues, we're gonna have some pictures, we're gonna do a little bit of everything. Um, and so uh, there's like these interstitial pieces, there's epigraphs, there's, I mean, like you really kind of like creatively, I think it's just a masterwork. And so my question is why all of the there's so much, there's so many variations in form. Yeah, you know, right, like let's show young people, there are no rules, we can tell the story however we want to tell it. And, you know, I, again, I think about those nights on the porch, you know, my grandmother spoke, my aunt spoke, my uncle spoke, my cousin spoke, and everybody had something different to bring to the mix. And that's what I was working to do with Loretta Little Looks Back. I call it a monologue novel because mm -hmm. it's first person. Each of the characters come out, they greet you, they shake the hand, they say hello, and they are talking to you. They're coming right up and saying, hello, I wanna talk to you. And there are poems and there are the blues and there is rhythm and there is musicality. And that's what I wanted to convey to young people. Again, that there's every way to tell a story. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. There's just every way. It almost feels like an album, you know, where it's mm. like, like, it really feels like, 
like you're on a musical journey or, or that we're watching a, mi a mini series or by the way at the kennedy center because we in dc because the politics and pros if the kennedy center is in here here you go this is your next one you know what i mean it's perfect for the stage right it's perfect for the stage it's the other thing i was like it was it's, it's wild how perfect it is for the stage um switching gears just a bit First of all, can I ask an honest question? Do y'all like working together? I always wanted to know this in real life. I, Cause like, I mean, most people it's like, you know, your partnership is interesting and it's complicated, but like it, when you, when you all are working and collaborating together, what is, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being, I'm not being flippant. I really, what is it like to work with your partner as a partner in this, you know? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, and I will say this, it's complicated. <laughs> It's been 30 years in the making, <laughs> perfecting it, and it changes like every year. So um, one of the things that helps keep us working and staying happily married is you'll notice we're in two different places. Mm. My studio is in Cypress Hills, which is about five miles from where our home is. And uh, even in quarantine, this is where I come. Cool. Um, but any other day, this is where I am. It's my cave. It's my studio. It's my factory. It's where I can drop in. The place can be a mess. And Andrea doesn't come visit me here. So she doesn't get the comment on my laundry that's laying on the floor or whatever's going on. And she likes it that way. And I like it that way. That's Another thing we do is um, we have set up guidelines so that we can communicate about the project we're working on together because it's very important. For example, um, when Andrea writes her stories, she loves for me to read them because I have you know, good comments as a visual person. I can see like the bigger picture. But one of her guidelines is whatever I read, no matter where I think it is in the process, I must start out my comments with, honey, you're off to a great start. <laughs> and that way, We're you know. off to a great start sometime <laughs> right? with something, yeah, right? right? <laughs> so we just start with that. Um, I likewise have criteria. And Andre, being an editor, has an has extraordinary eye for details, for composition, and when I show her some of my artwork, I'm, I'm in a very fragile state oftentimes. Um, my comment is she can't say something like, Loretta Little's foot looks like a football because that kind of hurts my feelings. She has to say Loretta Little's foot looks unresolved. I can kind of take that in, you know, make up some lame excuse, why that is, whatever it is, and I can work with that. So that kind of helps us a lot. That's um, so cool. Andre, do you want to talk about yeah some of the other? Yeah, yeah. You know, our do? situation is is kind of unique because you know, as folks may or may not know, authors and illustrators don't typically work together. Right. They don't they don't collaborate. You know, it's the person's job in the publishing company to keep those individuals separate. You know, some authors never even meet the illustrator who illustrates those books. But you know, I'm like sharing a box of cereal with this guy. You know, in a tube of toothpaste and all that. So, um, so we we don't really talk about work during the week. We have a meeting once a week on a Saturday, pre-COVID. It was in our favorite diner in Brooklyn. We went in, we sat in the booth in the back. They, they didn't even bring menus. They know us. We're there like several hours from like 11 in the morning to three in the afternoon. Now it's at the dining room table. And that's when we do the work. That's when we collaborate. So I have my Brian list that I know I'm waiting till Saturday. And, and that's when it happens, you know, and then we just end it. Like, you, you know, we have a little like guidelines. You can't be Saturday night brushing your teeth and saying, oh, one more thing about Loretta Little, you gotta wait till next week. Because we were talking about work all the time, 24 seven, and you have to put a little nice boundary around that. Is it, is it complete autonomy in terms of like, so like, okay, you write all these words, and then Brian reads these words, and, and it's sort of, he's gonna give his interpretation, his visual interpretation of what you've done, or is it some, a collaborative process, like we're both figuring out what this looks like, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, is it, is it complete trust, like hands off, like, all right, Brian, you know, this is what I'm doing, but you do what you do, and, and we're gonna make this thing go. Okay. Yes, it's a that's combination. Exactly it. Of, yeah, of I bop them over the head with a manuscript. <laughs> I say, "Honey, what? You know, let me know if this resonates with you." And then I step back. And you know, again, if we weren't married, I wouldn't know what he's doing in the studio. I wouldn't go in there. I'm not looking in the window. I'm not asking him about it. You know, I I, I think of the analogy like when I take something to the dry cleaner or to the tailor. I leave it there and I don't keep saying, well, how's it going? When are you gonna have it? You know, I don't keep asking them how it's going. Right. I, I turn it over and that's, I, I take it to the, to, the, to the tailor and I let my, my brilliant, uh, you know, husband work it out and it comes home and it 
gets laid out on the living room floor, and that's when I see it. Brian, can I, I ask? Will, no, please, yeah, please. go on. No, no, please go ahead, man. All right, so what I was going to add is there's one caveat, and it's usually the cover of the book. Uh, the cover of the book is extremely important. I, and I, I shoot from my heart. I can draw as much as I want and paint, but it's going to be viewed by hopefully thousands of viewers. Andrea has a really good eye on what can make a good cover. So I could do a beautiful painting and she'll say, honey, that's a beautiful painting. But for the cover, could you try something a little different? And I'm kind of like, okay. And I go back to the drawing table and then like from her little comments, I'm inspired and I'll do another couple versions. And we'll work like that together before we even show it to the publisher. Because there's something about us working together and we know each other so well, we know each other's strengths. And oftentimes I can do something that in the moment feels right to me, but I'm just like, you know, Brian, I think there's something more in there that you can do. And she just give me a couple little pointers and then I'll go back to the drawing table and, you know, hopefully voila. And it usually takes about six tries. That makes sense. That makes sense. Let me let me ask you about style since since you since you brought that up. I, I, you mm -hmm. know, Andrea's flexing a muscle in this book. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. she, she's really she's really showing off. I mean, she's she's getting busy yeah. on the page on, on the line. You know what I mean? I mean, there mm -hmm. are parts of this, but there are lines in this book where I'm like where I'm like, oh, like she's really 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 making sure everybody everybody knows that she's not coming to play. Is it is it for for you because this this the story spans over the course of what, three generations, I, I believe? Three mm -hmm. generations, right? So we're talking about a, a pretty wide swath of time, but it, but it stops It stops 50 years before now, right? Mm -hmm. Or so, 60 years before now or so. How did you choose the style in which this would look so that it felt fresh and of the time in which the story is taking place? Because when, I look at the, when you look at the cover of the book, it feels very much so like, a, a, a fresh, but it also, I mean, I can show you some of the, I want to show the people a couple of the sketches really quickly. Actually, you could probably show us sketches, Brian. It'd probably be easier for you to demonstrate for us. I, I come to think of it. I could do that. I'm in my studio. I have my paints. I'm ready to go. Let's do that. Because I, I, I want to say, I, I am curious, like, why you chose this particular style and if there's a mm -hmm. reason you chose this aesthetic for this particular book. Okay, good question. So I'm going to actually switch to another camera of my drawing table. This is a piece of paper, a white sheet of paper. And in the case of Loretta Little Looks Back, I would do a lot of research first, looking at old photos and images from the 1920s and 1930s to get a feel for the costume, how people looked. And then I usually start from my heart. And I think about like Andrea's writing, the fact that this stuff is very theatrical um, in the theater, there's movement often caused by the light and the different filters on the lights. So in the inside illustrations, I might start with, I'm thinking earth tone. So this is kind of a gray tone, but it represents the earth. These were sharecroppers. They worked with the land. They worked with the land every day. They were in the soil. Um, but there was an energy about it that earth held them. So I'm usually dealing with shapes that maybe look a little bit like a heart. And the shapes are very abstract. They're very abstract, but they're emotional. Another thing that I look at is I look at some of my favorite artists like Norman Lewis, who was an abstract expressionist who was working at the time. So often with a couple strokes of paint, he would suggest the South or um, the African-American experience and feeling. So once I have shapes like this, and I'll cover up many, many pages. Here's an example of something I did earlier. Then I go back in with the black line with a very special paintbrush. This is called an Ipsy. It's very thin, it holds a lot of ink. And then I will look into these shapes and I'll see what do I see here? And it's coming from a feeling place. So let's say I decide that I'm gonna do Loretta Little. And in my mind, I'm, I'm waiting for her form to come out of the soil, this rich soil. So it might be, you know, her as a little girl and she's, you know, figuring out how to pick the cotton, um, which her father taught her. So this is kind of her arm. 
you know, again, I did research to find out like, you know, what, what did the, what did their hairstyles look like? How was their hair matted and, and, and kept? Um, so this might be the little, little, the little girl, and that would be the cotton. I may go back in with white paint later. Or if I'm looking at the shape here and I'm thinking about, okay, now, you know, the next generation is her father, Roly. So what's Roly's personality? How do I feel that in this form? So I may read Andre's poem and it's talking about him, you know, um, spending the night in, you know, a dark night in the, in the soil and wrapped up in a quilt. So I might do something very fresh and, and quick like this, where he's, he's wearing a cap, I suggest, I su decided. And this is him wrapped up in a quilt while laying in the field. So, so the images come very fast. They're very fresh, but I may do hundreds of these to find out which one feels right to me. Or let's say I'm moving on to, um, Aggie B. So let's say the shape here is going to be Aggie B. And, and I'm thinking about, you know, she was very different than her father who was, you know, very thoughtful and, and a little worried, worried about the civil rights movement, worried about what was happening. But Aggie was much more determined. She got a certain foundation from her family. So I may decide that when I draw her, I want this to maybe symbolize her heart. And, you know, she's very powerful in a way, very determined. So this is her, you know, I'm gonna give her like longer ponytails. You know, right now I'm deciding I want her actually looking at the viewer. So I'm painting her eyes looking at us. You know, Andre talks about her overall, so I'm putting her in overall. I'm putting her hands on her hip because she had kind of has an attitude also. Very powerful young lady. So the style is, is fresh. It's simple, but also powerful at the same time. So there's some examples of some of the images that I've done. Man, that's, you know, first of all, Brian, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that in a, at a book, at a, like a reading or a signing or a launch or anything like that. You know, the joys of Zoom. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I'm not gonna lie, I feel like a child. Like I'm so excited, right? I'm so excited <laughs> by it all. Um, thank you for that, man. You know, I, I wanna make sure um, before we open it up for some Q&A, by the way, Put your questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to get to them in just a second. Um, I, I realized when you were drawing your pictures and, and, sh and, and demonstrating our, the illustrations, I realized that we didn't really give the audience what the book is about, right? And that's because I was just so excited. But um, if, you, if you could, and I don't want to give too much away because it's a book that like, this is a book for the heart. It's a book for like this is a this this is food, right? This is a book for the belly, right? Like this this is supposed to stick to you. Um, this will stick to you. And so, Andrea, if you had to, if you had to give us your 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 pitch for what this book is about, I almost feel disrespectful talking to you this way, but I have to. Um, <laughs> if you had to give us your pitch about what this book is about, what what would you say to the people? I would say to the people that this is a family story. It spans three generations starting in 1927, ends at the uh, presidential election of 1968, and shines a light on uh, African-Americans claiming the right to vote. There are three main characters, and I'm gonna give you a little glimpse of them, Jason, maybe that will help. So sure. our story opens with Loretta Little, and she says, right here, I'm sharing the honest to goodness. And then Brother Rowley comes on, I'm gonna reach back, tell how it all went. I'm gonna speak on it my way. And then we meet 12 year old Aggie B who will tell you, folks claim I got more nerve than a bad tooth, but there ain't nothing bad about being bold. And those are the three voices that, that change, come together and um, make for one story. Just, it's just really uh, a feat. It's an incredible book, it's an incredible story. It's really difficult to write in three eras, in three voices, uh, as well as as well as you did, I, I'm just so I shouldn't be impressed, but I'm just so impressed, and I'm so grateful that this work exists in the world. And I really, really mean this. This is a piece of anthropology. It's something that we should all be reading. 
please everybody. Um, please, I'm, I'm this, and you know, I do this all the time and people think I'm like, like I'm no liar. If I love it, I love it. If I don't, I'll figure out ways to say that I don't, right? <laughs> but but this, this is one that I, I truly think that this is, um, it's just one of those books. It's just one of those books. So please make sure you all pick it up from Politics and Prose um, right now. And uh, let's get to the questions. Let's get to the questions so that we can make sure that we get everybody. Because what happens is we talk and talk and then the questions come and we run out of time and everybody's upset. Um, all right, here we go. Mm. I'm getting ready to choose a novel to teach to my 11th graders. I'm looking for something to speak to the times we're living. What recommendations would you... All right, so that's a good question. Like what recommendations would we give for right now books to talk about the times this is a and this i think this is the point that that andre was saying earlier it doesn't like we have to make sure that they as much as we talk about today we have to make sure they understand where today comes from right and why today is important uh based on what happened yesterday or yesteryear you know right. and of course i'm going to recommend jason reynolds stamped well that's, that's very what i'm going to recommend <laughs> Yeah. yeah, definitely. And you know, both of those books are about really yesterday, but they're also about today and they're about tomorrow because those conversations were happening, whatever, 1927, 1968. They're happening now in 2020. They're going to be happening in 2022, 24, 2052. Yeah. So, so, you know, all these books, again, they're, 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 they're books of, of the time and of yesteryear and of the future. Absolutely. I think as many of these books as we can, that we can give to our young people to convince them to put their hands up is a powerful thing. You ain't, you're never too young to put your hand up. Right. Um, this is a good one. And I'm so curious. This one says, uh, Andrea, how did you organize your thoughts before putting pen to paper? Okay. I am an early riser. So at 4 a.m. I'm up and my thoughts are not organized. So it's a big mess. Uh, it's a it's a scribble notebook, and uh, it just kind of comes together. I just kind of massage it um, over time. And you know, again, I say to young people, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I, I wake up, I got post-it notes everywhere, and I just kind of stitch it together. It's like a quilt or a mosaic. I spread all the little pieces out, and I'm I'm like the seamstress, just kind of kind of sewing it together. Um, I will say that, you know, it is a monologue novel. I spend, a, living in New York, I spend a lot of time in the theater. And I do think about that immersive experience when you enter that, that space and you're in the dark and for two hours, everything falls away and you are invested in that, that world and those characters. And that is a trance that I kind of experience when I'm writing. Uh, and then that's why I depend on wonderful, amazing editors. My editor, Alvina Ling, you know, that's what editors do. You know, they kind of, hold the flashlight while I'm there doing the digging and the working out. Brian, do you storyboard? Is storyboarding a thing? Um, yes, I'll storyboard and, and um, it, it, it's gotten larger and larger, I noticed. And I think it's because I don't see so small anymore. So like the samples that I showed, I just cover up huge sheets of paper with just images over and over again. So again, I read Andre's words, I would get them so much into my psyche that then I would just start drawing you know, Aggie B over and over again, learn a little over and over again, scenes over and over again. And then I would choose which ones seem to resonate most um, and which ones go best together. And then I'd put them in the book. That's awesome. Uh, I love this question too, as from Yukari. Miss Pinkney, what is it like to be edited by someone else when you're also an editor? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question, Yukari. It is, it's a pleasure and a dream come true. Because remember, it's different sides of the brain. So when I'm up at 4 a.m. and I've got the writer hat on, I'm writer, I'm writer, I'm writer. And then at around 6 a.m., writer goes bye-bye, that switch is turned off, and then the editor in me, you know, that toggle is engaged. So. I depend on my editors. You know, I can't edit myself. It's like, it would be like trying to do my own dental work. You know, I can't see or, you know, trying to do something, you know, I need someone to help me do that. So I love it. I, I depend on editors greatly and I, I look for their, their guidance and their counsel and yeah, so. Do you think, is that, is that, I mean, there's not a lot of writer editors, but you think everyone, I wonder if everyone feels that way or people are, I, I always wondered about this, like how hard it, if it's hard or if everyone's like, oh, finally somebody can help me out, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's different. Again, it's different sides of the brain. And when I'm editing people, I'm there to serve them. And you're not thinking as a writer when you're editing? No, not at all. Mm -mm. Really? No. So let me ask you, okay, so, okay. So cone of, cone of truth, right? Like, here, here. <laughs> but let me, let me ask this. Has there ever been a time that you've been reading and editing something and you're like, oh, this is so almost good. But if I were writing it, I could really make this thing jam. If you, no. You've, never, you've no. never thought that. Not at all. Mm -mm. You, have no. so, you have so many more ethics than I have. Because I just feel like I, I'd be, it'd be so hard for me, you know? No, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not you. I, I, you know, I'm not you or Casey Callender or Sharon Flake. I'm not them. You know, they, they are them. And, and I could never tell the story like they would tell it. It's their story. It's, it's, it's themselves. So, yeah. yeah. Again, I'm just there to guide that process. Shout out to Casey Callender and Sharon Flake, by the way. Yes. For sure. <laughs> For sure. All right. Uh, this is a good one, too, from Karen Leggett. It's, uh, have you ever, have you ever, have, have there ever been ideas that you decided not to pursue as a book because one or the other of you didn't think it would work? Oh, that's a good one. Great question. <laughs> um, I think those are still in the filing drawers. Yep. And they still could come to light. Um, but there were projects that we started years ago that we didn't quite feel was right yet for whatever reason. It may have been the art, it might have been the writing. And we've had books that, that has happened in 10 years later, we saw the magic of what was happening and they did come to light. And Andre, I guess you can remember some of them that, that happened for. Um, uh, hand in Hand was one that was, was in the file cabinet for a while, I think. Right, Hand in Hand, 10 Black Men Who Changed America in a file for a decade, mm -hmm. completely written completely written or mostly written i should say and uh we just kind of were like all right let's give it a minute and mm -hmm. 10 years later and my style had changed and it was like the right time for the way i was working to do it and i think a lot of things just came together and i think we have projects now that are still not quite there yet and it's kind of trusting that they're um it's like the baby in the belly you know they're maybe only five months in and they need another you know four months <laughs> to fully develop. It's like the baby in the belly and also nothing like the baby in the belly. <laughs> That's right. I'll save you, Brian. I'll save you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do, I, I get that. I, that makes sense to me. I, you know, there's like, was, there's this myth around Robert Frost uh, that he would write a poem and then put it away. So he would write a poem every day, but then put it in a drawer and not check, and then like go back through the drawers after 10 years. And that's when he would like mm. turn the poem in. He would like edit and then turn it in after 10 years. It's so interesting. A little distance makes things, you know, illuminates things sometimes. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, this one's good too. I, I love this one. This one is from uh, Maria Salvador. And, and you mentioned a bit of this earlier, Andrea, you, when you talked about theater and your love of theater in New York City. You know, that's a, that's a, a big part of the New York City life. If for, for some of us. Uh, and so the question is, there's drama in both the voices and the illustrations in this book. Where and how do theater and storytelling and novels intersect? Uh, that's a great love question. This question. I love okay, it. first of all, Maria, I have to say, hug for Maria. Okay, so, um, so where do those intersect? All right, so when, when I walk, you know, when I put that, that, Tick it down, and I go into again those two hours. It's it's a story. It's a story coming to life, and and that's what I'm doing with Loretta Little Looks Back, which is that you know as a as an author I have a job. All right, so my job is to reach out a hand and say, "Come, reader, come. We are going on a journey together. You're gonna come with me." And I, I call it the page one pact. I, I call it the the page one pact. And I make a deal, I make a covenant with the reader. And the deal is this, if I'm doing my job to the best of my ability, you will come with me on this journey and you will stay with me until we are done. And you, child, will not even realize that you are reading a book because you are so immersed. And that's what happens when I walk into a theater and I'm so immersed in something. Like I said, everything falls away 
and I am right there. I'm not thinking about anything else. Uh, and that's, that's really what I'm, what I'm going for. Yeah. It's amazing. When I, uh, when I lived in New York, I mean, it was one of the, I mean, I miss, I miss a lot of things about New York, but I really miss the theater. And, you know, the one thing about the theater for me has always been, there's a strange thing about the human element in the theater that you can't get any, anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But that if you're, but, but that, but that you're writing, if you hit it, like if you really, if you get it right, your writing can do, right? So like it's this weird thing when you're on, when you're when you're in the theater, it's a human being in front of you. I mean, like you can see the sweat, you can see, I mean, you can reach out and touch people, right? You can feel the energy in the room, you can feel uh, the drama and the and the pain and the comedy and whatever is happening. There there is backdraft, right? If you're sitting in the audience, and I think that is it's it's very particular and specific for the theater. But I do think that like, there are parts of this book that made me feel that way, with that way, right? Whether it be the language that you're using and my relationship to that language because of my own family uh, and because of the history of my own people, uh, whether it be the setting and the, uh, and, the, and the description of what it is to pick cotton or, or what it means to be hugged by your mother, right? Mm -hmm. Like how to describe the, a, a mother's hug, which is, which when I read it, you know, I, I got so emotional because I am such a mama's boy. Um, right, but that's all very much so to me parallel to that feeling that that like that that there's a kinetic energy to that, like it is when you're when you're in the theater watching watching a show. Kudos to you for sure. Thank you, thank you. And you know, racism also, Jason, which of course is touched on in this book, it's something you have to experience to really know what it is. And so that's what I'm going for with so many of the books that I write, you know, Loretta Little being an example of kind of a page to stage experience, but really wanting to get behind the eyes, under the skin, you know, just that, that prickly feeling, uh, you know, trying to just allow readers to feel that feeling. Absolutely. Um, and, and I encourage young people to get together in a group and do it as a read aloud. And you know, feel the blisters on on Loretta's fingers as she is picking that cotton. Absolutely, racism, the theater of the absurd, right? Right. <laughs> but there, it's, it's interesting because there's a there's a question that's tied directly to what you just said. Uh, Sarah Hudson says, "What do you say to parents who are afraid to show the sad parts of of our history to to their children, you know, especially younger children?" And what advice? Or is there any advice you would give for choosing books to help? Brian, do you want to ask, answer that question? Um, you know, my thought on that is that we're used to talking to our children. And children experience sadness every day. And they experience loss every day. So to kind of find a way to communicate to them in real world experiences that they've experienced. And then making that seem understanding it on a bigger level. So if it's that, you know, they had an experience in school of, you know, a friend not treating them very well, you know, what that must feel like on a, on a bigger level of having a whole race not being treated fairly. Mm. And imagine what that would feel like. Um, having, you know, feeling bad about yourself. If, you know, even your friend says something negative about you, what that must feel like for a grown man to have that experience. And then books like Loretta Little, where, um, it could be read aloud and it could be um, maybe, you know, communicated with your child to feel that that's the right book for your child, depending on the age. Like the Red Little, I think nine years old is an appropriate age to read that too. Um, younger than that, I would say, you know, maybe some of our other books that were about like um, Heroes and Sheroes from the Civil Rights Movement, that are actually geared towards younger children. Um, you know, about like our book on Sojourner Truth or, um, uh, Martin Rising, you know. So that would be my suggestion. For sure. Right. And Jason, as you know, because you do it so well, you know, like a book like Stamp, you know, it's, it's, we, we can talk to our kids, but we have to listen to them. We have to let them pull up a chair and, and, and talk to us and listen. And that's the beauty of so many books that are available now and always, you know, they, they open up, they, they peel open, they allow uh, us to have those conversations and they allow us to, you know, again, in the case of books that have visuals in them, 
you know, we can look at, look at the pictures and talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's the golden opportunity. You know, we can read together, we can have a conversation. And it's like talking to kids about, again, about anything that, that, that we want to talk to them about. Um, books allow, allow that conversation to get started. Andre, if you don't mind me asking, how many, how many, and both of you, how many years have y'all been in this game? 30. I, 35 <laughs> for me. Yeah, 30, 35. So 30, 35 years. Um, I, and, and so my question is, and this is just me, since I have you here, I get to ask mm -hmm. selfishly. Um, how are we moving forward? Are we, is it, first of all, I want to make sure that we know that like books about black kids have been around, like it's been happening, right? Like it's been <laughs> happening for a very long time before my generation and this new sort of crop it's not a new thing. It, there was no social media, right? But it, there have been many, 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 many writers writing many, 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 many books. Um, but my question is, do you think, like, how do you feel about what's happening now? Do, are we moving forward? Are things changing? Um, I don't know, like, what's your, I mean, 30, 30 years in, like, one day I hope to have 30 years in and, and look back and look forward and, and see things. And hopefully I'll be smiling and, you know, have we have we carried the torch all right? Like, do you feel like, what do you think? Are we dropping the ball? Do, where, where can we, are there holes? You know, like, I'm serious. I want to know because because I got work to do, right? And I want to make sure I'm doing my job. Well, like, it's your voice. Like, you have a unique perspective um, where you're writing from, which is genuine to you. And, um, you know, the books that I was doing 35 years ago were filling the void there. You know, like Andre and I realized there were no books uh, you know, biographies about African Americans. There were many books about biographies about anyone at that time. So that was a, a, a space that, you know, our interests filled. And now there are, there are new spaces that we can't fill because it's not necessarily our story. And I think, you know, your stories are kind of filling those places. Um, and I think the main thing is just to make sure we just keep publishing good books. You know, we just keep making sure we put them out there. Um, I don't understand the social media thing. I mean, I think one of the things that helps me is that I've been here for so long. I have a lot of books out there that kind of speak for themselves, but sure. you know, like to be able to reach young people through social media, to get them off social media, to pick up a book, I think is, a, is an amazing, is an amazing tool. And, and to, so both of those can kind of work together. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what's happening now, Jason, is that um, we are strengthening our shoulders and what I mean by that is none of us would be having this conversation, you know, without Virginia Hamilton, without Patricia McKissick, without Walter Dean Myers. I mean, the list goes on. You know, those are the shoulders that we are all on this, this Zoom call. We are all, you know, Walter is with us, Pat is with us, Virginia is with us, you know, the, the list goes on. And so those are the shoulders. And so now what's happening today is that, you know, we're all just bulking up, you know, to, 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 make our shoulders stronger and we have to just keep doing that. So is it changing? Yes. Is it slow? Yes. Do we need more shoulders? Yes. This is from Tammy O'Donnell. Brian, what advice uh, do you have? What, ab what advice would you give students interested in working in art, graphic art, or illustrations? Uh, draw, paint, make art, make images, any way that you can. So for me, I still like working with actual paint and paper. Um, a lot of people now are doing stuff digitally. And my thing is just draw paint often. If it's on an iPad, if it's with real paint and paper, and look at art, like go back and look at the masters, look at, um, go to museums if you can. Now you can look at mu uh, museums on websites, you know, um, look at art that, inspires you even if you don't know how it's made find out how it's made and yeah just keep making pictures and showing them to people getting them in front of people so you can see how that if people see what what it is that you're after what you just did for us was that paint or was that ink or that was paint and ink so the, the gray was uh acrylic and gouache and the uh, black was india ink yeah so cool hey yeah, it's so it's so amazing. I was one time I was talking to Greg Christie and we were down in Georgia and he said the most profound thing to me. because uh, I was asking him about being an illustrator and, and, and the importance of it. 
um, especially as a black person. And he said, he said, um, man, you got to make sure that it's good. You got to make sure that the art is good. Like it has to be like technically good. Right. And I was like, well, cool. But like, is there a reason why you feel so <laughs> adamantly about this? He said, what you don't, what you fail to understand is that what the children's book illustrator does is that is that is 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 basically the children's book illustrator is the is the very person that begins to develop the palette of the child, right? Mm -hmm. So like that child mm -hmm. that child's art palette, the the palette to recognize the thing that it likes, right? The thing that that child mm -hmm. loves, or, or or as it gets older, right? What it what it sort of gravitates toward aesthetically mm -hmm. comes first and foremost from what it sees in a picture book, which to me I never thought about, but the profundity of the statement. It's pretty incredible, you know. Mm -hmm. Really incredible stuff. This is another one for you, Brian. Somebody says, "Do you pre what do you prefer? Do you prefer picture books or do you prefer an illustrated novel like this?" Uh, I like both. I like both. I think what I love about a picture book in a theater where like there's real people in front of you on stage and it's all around you. In a picture book, that's what I get to do. I get to create the whole stage, the characters, the lighting, the backdrop that you drop into so I can make a whole world. Mm -hmm. What's nice about the illustrated novel is I get to back up a little bit and be like, okay, how can I do something that's magical and, and maybe small? Like, like I'm making little visual poems, I call them. Um, in the case of Loretta Little Looks Back. So I get to come up with these graphic little images that don't have to necessarily tell a story, but kind of add to it. So they're kind of like jewelry or gems. And, and that's a, a great experience to have also. Andre, can I ask you, can I ask you something? Um, what'd you learn? Because I'm always curious. I mean, this process, writing is such a, it's a strange thing that only we kind of understand. <laughs> We're <laughs> weird. Like, <laughs> we don't need it. <laughs> strange experience. And I feel like every time, every time we do this, we come out a little different. Um, and so this time around for you, uh, did you learn anything? About the writing process, you mean? Or just the, the content? It's or it's, it's open. About you? It's open. About about you, about the process, about, about um, you know, the, the, the information that you're putting in this book, about any, any of those things. Yes, yes, okay. So I learned a couple things in terms of process. You know, it's kind of like I was saying with young people, you know, I know now that I can just listen and I can hear someone say, you know, say what you want about the way I'm bringing it. Hmm. And that can be the beginning of the story. And you pointed out, I learned that storytelling can happen in many ways. Now, specific to Loretta Little, one thing I learned that I didn't know, and I did a lot of research, and it was, you know, rooted in the oral tradition of my own family, and I uh, interviewed people that had been sharecroppers and worked with university professors and all that. What I didn't know was that um, young kids had to quit school. Um, and there's a, a mention of that, you know, where young Loretta has to leave sixth grade and she doesn't want to leave and how upsetting that is. You know, I knew it, but I, I didn't really fully know it until I, um, you know, interviewed a lot of people who had been sharecroppers and just how sad that is. Yeah. yeah. She couldn't get, continue with school, even though she's so smart. You know, I, um, I've done all this work uh, in the middle of America and, you know, it's fascinating because there are places in Illinois and places in Wisconsin where kids can't finish school now, still, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they have to, they have to work on the farm. Uh, somebody got to, somebody got to get the crop done, and somebody got to carry those roads. And that's a very real, real, real thing. My mom talked about it all the time about being a kid and how it was such a big deal. My mom is seventy-five, and so she from South Carolina, and talking about how how big of a deal it was to you had, you had to fight for school. You had to fight your parents mm -hmm. to go to school. To go to school because um, because they needed you on the farm. they needed you in, in 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 the field because the more the more that was picked the more that was paid mm -hmm. you know and that's mm -hmm. a very very real thing um, that's so interesting also really quickly one more selfish question then I'll take another question and then we'll close it out but I you know I haven't seen anybody in a long time I know it's so crazy a lot I gotta get out it's true, a lot right? I gotta get out you know like, oh, people I, I know uh, all the research 
I, I, Lori Harzander told me this a long time ago about like all the research you do, but how little of it you actually use. Like, is that, was that the case for you? Like, did you do a bunch of research and you're like, and I'm going to use 5% but the actual novel, but yes. you have to know it all. <laughs> yeah, ton of research, a lot ended up on the cutting room floor. But again, that's the beauty of a file cabinet. You know, it'll hopefully be used some other way. And, you know, it's just good information to have. Hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing is wrong with being smarter, ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> ever. All right, this is from Beth Olszewski. Sorry, Beth, if I, if I, if I blew that. Uh, can either of you talk about your current, first of all, I want to apologize in advance for Beth, for what she's about to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I am going to honor Beth's question. Uh, can either of you talk about your current uh, upcoming projects, either together or independently? Beth, this just came out. I want to I want to start there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if there's anything else you guys got going on uh, independently or together, Beth would love to know. <laughs> oh, Beth, um, I did a book with Carol Boston Weatherford called um, A Dream for Daughters, which is um, a beautiful story about, you know, a mother's concern for her daughter, African-American daughter growing up in America and that, you know, life be good for her and, and that she be protected. Um, I also have a book that I wrote and illustrated coming out called Time for Kenny, which is for little kids. And it's, you know, just a story about this little boy named Kenny and his interaction with his family that's kind of like this loving unit and just beautiful four little scenarios that happen there. So that'll be coming out shortly. Okay. Thank you, Beth, for the question. Um, I, have, I have three the things I'm very excited about. Okay, so the next book is, um, uh, it's part of Chelsea Clinton's She Persisted series, which is now a reader series. So uh, I'm, my book is kicking off the series with a, a collaboration with Chelsea about Harriet Tubman. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and then I have two interesting projects that aren't totally book related, but they are in some respects. Um, and the first is um, there's an exhibition called Picture the Dream, the story of civil rights through the children's book, which is now at the High Museum in Atlanta. Uh, wonderful art, everybody from Kadir Nelson to Brian Collier to Brian Pinkney to Jerry Pinkney, um, telling the story of civil rights is told through the children's picture book. It will travel nationally. We'll go to the Eric Carle Museum in February and then all over the nation. And last but certainly not least, I'm very excited um, December 2021, mark your calendars for the world premiere of the Snowy Day Opera. Um, I am the librettist of the Snowy Day Opera, which was supposed to have its world premiere uh, at the Houston Grand Opera December 2020, but with COVID, uh, it's been postponed a year, um, but very excited. And we're now in the process of making the documentary, which is the making of uh, the Snowy Day Opera based on the best-selling beloved classic by Ezra Tech. So that is, that, that's new and, and fun. That's amazing. I, I, I saw the, uh, the, ex the exhibition in Atlanta. I happened to be down there. And uh, it's amazing. Every, everybody is in this thing. It was, it was really something, oh, uh, so something to see. Margaret's back. Margaret, you're back already? Is, is it over already? Oh, I know. I wish we could go on longer. I know. This time uh, has come so quickly. Um, I have one more question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. This is for Andrea. Andrea, are you swimming? Ah, Jason, can you come and install a pool in my house? I'm trying to figure it out for myself. I, oh my I, I'm, gosh. I'm really No, bad. no. Speaking of building up the shoulders, mm, can't. No can't. swim. A lot of walking, though. I'm doing walking. I'm walking every morning. I just bought a All water right. rower, so I'm doing that. I'm doing the water rower. It's good. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thanks to Jason uh, for for leading the conversation and, and thanks to both the Pink Needs, a special, um, you know, uh, shout out to Brian for sharing his, his amazing art. That was just incredible to see. Um, and, and again, thank you and thank the audience, all of you for attending. Uh, reminder that you can get the book, um, the, the link is in, in our chat and you can always get it, uh, you know, at our store. Please check our website calendar for other um, upcoming events, including a shout out now to Jason. October 13th, we're going to do an event 
for the graphic novel version of Long Way Down. Jason will be there, along with the graphic illustrator, Danica Novogorodov. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, and they're gonna be in conversation with Jean Yang. So it's gonna be a real special night, just like tonight was. Um, so anyway, um, without further ado, we'll close it out. Thank you again. I hope everyone stays safe. And of course, keep reading and stay well read. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Margaret. Thank you yeah. Jason. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jason. Good seeing you. Stay safe. Okay.